question? Well, we saw with, uh, like the We Charity scandal, uh, the SNC Lavalin scandals found, you know, saw the prime minister found guilty of breaking ethics laws for a second time. The first time it was his uh, illegal trip to Billionaire Island. The second time was his uh, his interference in the criminal prosecution of his friends uh, at SNC Lavalin, and now he's under investigation, and we're uh, awaiting the uh, the report from the ethics commissioner on his involvement, his failure to recuse himself, the conflict of interest in in awarding a half billion dollar agreement to a group that had paid his family half a million dollars. And so th this... Hello, dear viewers, and welcome back to another episode of This Week in Canada. This one's a very special one, because look who's back. Hi, everyone. <laughs> it's so lovely <laughs> to be here. Not only back at the post-manual offices, but with Roberto. And I'm in Canada, my favorite country in the world. Yeah, yeah, sure. And uh, <laughs> we have a very special episode because not only is Nico here, but we have an interview with MP, Ethics Committee member, one that you might recognize from the We Charity scandal. Mr. Michael Barrett is joining us for a full-length interview. And we have premium content, a full episode after that of me and Nico chatting about all the news as we regularly do, which you can find in the links below. Go, there should be a link that has our premium content right there. So without further to do, let's go into our great interview with Mr. Michael Barrett. Hello, dear viewers, and thank you for joining us. We have a very special guest with us today. He is the MP for Leeds, Grenville of the Thousand Islands, and uh, uh, the ethics critic, we have Michael Barrett. Thank you very much for joining us today out of uh, taking time out of your busy schedule. Thanks for having me on. It's been, it's, or it's going to be a crazy week in Canadian politics. We have the Liberal Convention, which is going to be uh, held over the next few days. And it seems to me that it's a bit of an open secret that the Liberals are really preparing for an election. They've got their you know, nominees ready. They're getting the groundwork established. And I think a lot of talk in the convention is about that. Obviously, there's been a few, a few polls that have come out recently. And the Conservatives aren't looking too strong. And I wanted to know whether you think that the Conservative Party are ready to defeat Justin Trudeau. Look, you, you have a situation where we're not 12 months into uh, the tenure of our new leader, Aaron O'Toole. And, uh, and you know, everything in COVID feels like it, it takes a lot longer. It's gone on for a lot longer sometimes than it really has. Um, you know, the, you hear people joke sometimes that, um, this year has been the longest uh, 10 years of their life. And, uh, and sometimes it, it, it feels that way. So uh, while it feels like uh, Aaron's been the leader for quite a long time, he, he only, uh, only was elected by our membership in August. So um, he's still introducing himself to Canadians. Uh, but that being said, our, our party apparatus is absolutely ready uh, for an election. Would we like more time? Uh, to uh, to make sure that uh, the the measures that need to be put in place to help Canadians uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic are, are established and that Canadians are supported? Absolutely. Do we want more time for our leader, Aaron O'Toole, to meet, uh, to meet Canadians? Uh, of course. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the Liberals' uh, decision on, on when there's an election. And they're going to do it at a time that's opportune for them. And, and if you look at what's going on, I mean, uh, the, the health committee uh, was ordered by the house to meet and uh, for the procurement minister and for the health minister uh, to, to testify. And uh, the chair didn't even call a meeting. They're, they're daring, uh, the, the government is daring uh, the opposition to, uh, to, to challenge them in the house. And uh, it's, it's really unfortunate. You know, we're, we're quite focused as the official opposition on, on our job. In, in Parliament, um, and the government's very, very focused, and they're very attracted to uh, to, to polling numbers. But I think that uh, elections matter, and um, it would be a, it would be not only a, a, a poor decision in terms of public health and safety for for the government to trigger an election uh, right now when people are uh, are worried about their lives and their livelihoods. I think that um, they might be underestimating uh, the the Conservatives. Yeah, but what you or what would you put the negative polling down to then? Is it just because there are no tools new? Well, I, I mean, you look at the result of every election in the country that's that's been held since the start of the pandemic, 
and the results have been very good for the incumbent. Uh, you know, people want their government to do well when they're looking to their government for help. And so uh, we just had an election in 2019, uh, which saw increased fortunes for, uh, for the Conservatives. We, we picked up seats um, and, and not a small number. Uh, you know, it's, um, the, there's, there's good momentum uh, behind us. We held the Liberals to a, to a minority government. And, uh, and I think we'll make improvements again. But, but right now, uh, when Canadians, again, they're, they're worried about uh, what they're worried about. They're worried about their, their businesses closed because of lockdowns. They're worried about the health of their, their family members with hospitals that are, um, that are stretched. And so th they're not particularly worried about an election today, many Canadians. And, and so uh, what do they want? They want the government that is promising support for them to do well. And, uh, and, and part of that, uh, you know, translates at the ballot box to support for the incumbents. Uh, I, th I think that's a good point. But I think uh, a lot of people really recognize you from your work during the We Charity scandal is when, you know, you see your face a lot of the time on CPAC or on TV. Um, and that is something that's been going on for a long time now. It started in, I think, spring of last year or midsummer sometime last year. It's been going on for a while. And what you were saying with... Uh, what Canadians care about right now is, you know, their homes and livelihoods. But the We Charity scandal hasn't really been resolved. Uh, if there was a scandal that was going to take down really the Trudeau government, this should have been it. But I feel like the focus kind of got taken away a little bit because there was obviously a pandemic going on. So I guess my question is really just like what with this thing still not really resolved, what should Canadians uh, know that they need to be focused on with this We Charity thing that has still not seen any real action or repercussion? Well, we saw with, uh, like the We Charity scandal, uh, the SNC Lavalin scandals found, you know, saw the Prime Minister found guilty of breaking ethics laws for a second time. The first time it was his uh, illegal trip to Billionaire Island. The second time was his, uh, his interference in the criminal prosecution of his friends uh, at SNC Lavalin. And now he's under investigation and we're uh, awaiting the uh, the report from the ethics commissioner on his involvement, his failure to recuse himself, the conflict of interest in, in awarding a half billion dollar agreement to a group that had paid his family half a million dollars. And so th this, this scandal was really heating up last summer and uh, the prime minister um, was, was suffering. Uh, you know, th this, this government, the, the liberal government very much uh, governs by public opinion polling instead of based on principle or what's what's best for the country. And uh, when they saw that things were not going well for them uh, in the polls, uh, they prorogued parliament, they shut it down. And so that killed the work that was happening at the Finance Committee and at the Ethics Committee. And when the House resumed, they filibustered for, uh, for the equivalent of 20 meetings uh, at the Ethics Committee, and which is quite significant. And then when we finally were able to uh, we withstood the filibuster. We were finally able to order witnesses to appear. Um, that was December 1st of 2020. And it wasn't until mid-March when those witnesses, we finally got them in front of committee after ordering them to be there. And so uh, the government is still, you know, still has plenty to hide and plenty to answer for. Um, the, the latest testimony that we had from Craig and Mark Kielberger demonstrated that um, there's not a forthrightness with respect to the involvement of senior government officials in the, in the prime minister's office, like Rick Tice, like Ben Chin, uh, like uh, Amit Paul Singh from the finance department. And when the House ordered them to appear, so there was an order of, of the House, a majority of parliamentarians ordered that those three individuals and an individual testify, um, Zita Astrovas at the Defense Committee on the sexual misconduct scandal plaguing the defense minister and the prime minister, um, they didn't send, they ordered the witnesses, the government ordered the witnesses not to appear against an order of the House of Commons. So the cover-up is in full effect. And so, um, you know, you know, I've been asked many times why, you know, why are you still talking about, you know, the Lee scandal? Isn't, you know, isn't that done? Um, no, you know, the government has been very successful. The Trudeau Liberals have been very successful interrupting us when we are getting accountability for Canadians. It's not a trivial matter when you're talking about a half billion dollars going to a group that paid members of the prime minister's family half a million dollars. That is banana. Yeah, it's yeah, corruption. True. Yeah. Bobby and I were actually talking before the podcast started and we were saying, what should we ask, you know, our boy, Michael Barrett? And, uh, and, and one of the questions that came up was, what's your favorite Trudeau scandal? You know, the scandal that makes you go home 
and think, I can't believe they've done that. <laughs> you know, a really shock. Bad, of course. But that, but if you were to have a favorite, I mean. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're all bad. So yeah, it's, 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 it's all bad. And uh, I mean, th there's, of course, like many scandals beyond uh, just the ethics. But, but with respect to those, those big three, um, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Look, I was elected by by-election in, uh, in December of 2018. And I was sworn in uh, January 28th, uh, 2019. And I was put on the, the Justice Committee. And it was 10 days later that the story broke in the Globe and Mail about the, about the SNC-Lavalin scandal. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, this is unbelievable where we have a, a prime minister, um, you know, asking the attorney general to, to put her thumb on the scales of, of justice. And, and, you know, it's unbelievable in, in the context of polite Canadian politics, particularly liberal politics, the attorney general looked the prime minister in the eye and said no. And he fired her, he kicked her out of cabinet, you know, uh, you know kicked her out of the party. And uh, it's, it's unbelievable. He, of course, he was found to have interfered. Um, the, the question of whether or not this constituted a criminal offense, there, there were not charges uh, laid, but the question, of, um, the, the question of interference that occurred uh, with respect to, to the, the prime minister um, not, not answering questions from the ethics commissioner, that's detailed in the Trudeau report too. Um, you can expect that the, the veil of cabinet confidence was used to protect the prime minister from from serious inquiry also by law enforcement. And so um, it's, it's really the, the, uh, the gravity of that situation is unbelievable. And, um, and really, uh, you know, in a testament to the character of, the, of some of the, the players there, um, Jody Wilson-Raybould, she, Canada's first uh, Indigenous Attorney General, uh, she, uh, she sacrificed her seat at the cabinet table and ultimately her seat in the government caucus to do the right thing. And so that's, that's you know, incredible, uh, you know, an incredibly principled position to take. Uh, and I think it demonstrates um, the absolute, uh, you know, vacuum of principles in the prime minister's office to allow that to happen. So that's really staggering. That was my, my baptism in, in yeah, yeah. politics 10 days after I'm sworn in, you know, the prime minister saying, oh, the story in the Globe and Mail is false. And we know that in fact, uh, he was lying. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty good point. So one question, I, this is not one I had written down, but I kind of wanted to ask it was, uh, how do you think that uh, the Canadian media has, do you think they've done a good job in Canada at covering these scandals? And the reason I ask this is I think of different scandals that ha scandals that happen to, say, conservatives, where you get, say, I think it was like Andrew Shearer at an airport, not wearing a mask, pre-mandate, not sitting around anybody. And it's like the front page of, you know, of whatever site there is. And sometimes I see international media, I think, doing a better job at covering Trudeau and holding him to account, where I, I think that's kind of different than it used to be. I think the international media used to have a big love affair with him, thinking he was like this kind of feminist Obama type of guy. Um, so I just kind of want to ask, like, how do you think the media has done in, uh, has, have they helped in keeping the momentum of these scandals? Or, or do you think they could have done a better job? It's just something that, like, off the top of my head, how do you think? Yeah, I mean... Uh... Look, it's it's a real challenge for us to to punch through, uh, particularly when there's all of the um, you know uh, interest in in vaccines and uh, in um, in that in that process in the in the measures that the government's going. They're, they're spending records amount record amounts of money, hundreds of billions of dollars um, is is being uh, sprayed in in government cash into. Uh, into all sorts of areas in the country, it's it's tough to to get an edge when when you're competing with with that from the government. But uh, I think that there has been, um, you know, look the uh, last week um, when one of the witnesses was ordered to appear and uh, the government didn't send uh, didn't send the witness. They ordered them not to appear. They sent the minister of middle class prosperity uh, in place of a witness uh, that you know she had no knowledge, of course, of of, of actually what occurred. Um, you know, it, it, it got coverage. It, it appeared on the, the front page of the National Post. Um, I think that there has been, um, at its peaks, uh, there's been a fair amount of, of media attention. But 
then the question is, uh, and I was asked this at a, at a press conference a couple of weeks ago by a journalist, you know, uh, they said they were out east and, and, you know, Canadians aren't really, you know, out there. Nobody was talking about this. Well, you know, it, the, the, the search for answers continues, and I think it is incumbent on the media to, to continue to report the efforts that are, are being made. The opposition has done a very good job of, uh, you know, and I think that by any objective standard, it's true, they've done a very good job of walking and chewing gum at the same time on this, you know, holding the government to account on their pandemic response, pressing them for a budget, which they didn't present for, uh, they still haven't, but uh, it, it'll be two years, over two years, in between budgets for them, and still and still making sure, holding their feet to the fire uh, to make sure that Canadians can have confidence in their public institutions uh, and not see them plagued by scandal and insider deals with half billions in exchange for half millions. And so, um, so the, gov the, the, the government is, uh, you know, needs to be scrutinized and the, the media does need to continue to cover it, even though uh, I appreciate that part of the news is that things have to be new. Uh, the government has, uh, the, the Trudeau Liberals, you know, they shut down Parliament, they, they, uh, they filibustered committees. And so the opposition has to get back to work and, and do that. And, um, and so uh, we're, we're, we're pressing on with our work. And so uh, we do uh, expect that when we're in a situation where the government has ignored a majority of members of the House of Commons in ordering either these witnesses or the Prime Minister to appear, that that will get, uh, that that will get you know, uh, grab some headlines uh, today when, uh, when the, the deadlines pass for those witnesses to have appeared. Uh, did you have another question? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, probably our last question, I understand you're quite busy. We had three heroes, I would say, throughout the Wii scandal. We had obviously Pierre Polyev. I mean, do you remember when he sort of took over that committee and, <laughs> you know, became the, the power <laughs> supreme? Yeah, that was a wonderful <laughs> moment. Then we had obviously you, you know, I think this was your tour de force. You really held them to account. And finally, and I think rather surprisingly, we had Charlie Angus. I think Charlie Angus was great through most of it. I don't know whether you got close to him or whether you worked with him, but I was sort of personally afflicted, a bit wounded, when we found out that he voted with the government on the vote of non-confidence. I mean, it seems like all this work went to nothing because it seems to me the NDP just can't afford an election. Did you feel a bit aggrieved as well? Were you, you know, betrayed in any way, do you think? Yeah, and, and so uh, Charlie, you know, he's really dug in and particularly on the alleged donor fraud that's gone on, uh, he's, he's done a lot of work in, in bringing that to light. And, uh, and, you know, that's certainly to his credit. Uh, you know, we have, we have a situation where in a minority parliament, the leaders have all kind of staked out their ground and we've got uh, the, the NDP leader has said that um, they're not gonna bring the government down. And so uh, that really puts, uh, puts their members um, in a box. And, uh, and I mean, the NDP uh, aren't, uh, aren't jockeying for um, aren't jockeying for second position in the polls these days either. And so uh, you look at, uh, at, from that perspective, is the NDP going to be able to do more uh, in terms of, you know, uh, making an arrangement with the government uh, in exchange for supporting them on that, in that, uh, that confidence matter, that anti-corruption committee that we look to form in the fall? Um, or should, you know, should we have gone to the polls and, uh, you know, called the government's bluff and uh, and seeing what happens, I mean, of course, the the worst possible outcome there is that the the liberals uh, would come back with a majority, and we would get no answers for right. Canadians. Mm -hmm. The studies wouldn't have been completed. The election would have been done before we got the report back from the ethics commissioner. So, um, so I think that's the argument that's to be made there. But was I disappointed? Of course, I was disappointed. Yeah. Uh, and and I think that it was unbelievably irresponsible. It was reckless of of Prime Minister Trudeau to threatened to call an election when the majority opposition wanted to form a committee to examine if there was corruption. You know, it, it's, it's pretty simple. If you don't have anything to hide, then you shouldn't be, you know, uh, you shouldn't be fearful of the scrutiny that uh, the parliamentarians would apply to the dealings of the government. So it says, I think it says an awful lot about, uh, about Justin Trudeau that uh, they made that a matter of confidence. Well, I mean, I do have more questions, but unfortunately we have run out of time and we have to get going. But I want to thank you once again, Mr. Barrett, for joining us here today. Uh, hopefully you can come back soon and hopefully we can get some more 
uh, conservative MPs on. I think we're trying to get Pierre Polyev back on the show, but hopefully you could join, join us again sometime soon. Yeah, Thanks that so sounds much. great. Take Thanks care, guys. Lot. Brilliant. Well, thank you. That was great. Ah, what a fantastic interview. Genuinely very happy that Mr. Michael Barrett could take time out of his busy schedule to come and join us here today. Nico, what did you think? I thought he was a wonderful guy. I found it quite interesting. Um, it's good to put a, uh, you know, I, I interviewed him once before, but you know, you see these guys on TV and the rest of it and you get sort of an idea of what they're like. And you know, I always thought Michael Barrett was nice. And it turns out he is nice. How wonderful is that? <laughs> That's yeah, fantastic news. You know who else is nice? Nico and I. And if you like us a whole lot, you can go down to the links below and check out our premium content. That's where you'll get your regular dose of This Week in Canada. It was a crazy week in Canada. There was lockdowns, churches getting raided, the whole shebang. So why don't you go and check that out? Make sure you buy a t-shirt. Make sure you join our, jo join our mailing list. And why don't you leave a donation in the links below as well. There's a whole bunch there. Go and like our Facebook page as well. It's growing big time. Apparently we have a lot more fans than I thought. Uh, a lot of you guys actually like us. And leave a nice comment. Nico's been feeling a little down lately. He's getting some jet lag stuff sorted. So, uh, anything else you gotta say? No, that's it. And thanks for bringing it up, Bobby. But, uh, you know, sit lovely to see you. Bye-bye. Au revoir.